This is the Augusto Digital Insights Podcast, and I'm your host, Brian Anderson. Here we talk to industry leaders about how they're using digital technology to transform their businesses. There's a lot to cover here, so let's get started. Welcome to the Augusto Digital Insights Podcast. This episode is part of a series focused on the people behind Augusto. I want to highlight our shared history, which is the foundation of how Augusto has grown, operates, and these relationships guide our vision for the future. Joel Ross is a co-founder of Augusto. He has a 20-year career focused on consulting, computer science, product development, team leadership, and financial management. Joel is currently the Augusto CFO and integrator, a term from the popular EOS uh, methodology. Welcome to the podcast, Joel. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to this. It should be fun. Cool. Well, Joel, you and I have been together for a long time working on different ventures. Yes, really, my my probably my longest business partner in my life is you. And uh, knowing you through before we even had kids and first job right out of college and stuff, right? Yeah, I think you were the first person when when at, at Crow when they were interviewing on campus at Michigan State. You were the greeter, the the basically the person who made sure that everybody was comfortable before they went into the interview. You were the greeter at the uh, at my interviews there. And that was way back when we when I worked at Crow Chiswick and we were recruiting. We used to do campus recruiting. We'd go to all the different campuses and we'd set up booths and we'd have like a whole process for how we'd recruit uh, college talent. And so you were you were someone we were attracted to. And uh, yeah, I, I vaguely remember that. It's so funny because I did so many of those, but it is a, it, it goes back to show how, how far back it was that we actually met. And that was, t- when did you graduate? It was 99. So, so like spring of 99 would have been. <laughs> over 20 years ago, right? Yep. Over 20 years ago. And uh, so, so I'm a little curious though, what was the history that led you into computer science and consulting? Yeah, that's a good question. I was thinking about that. I, I I think I started writing my first software program on a TI-85 when I was in high school. That was my first experience writing code. I'm like, that's that's a lot of fun. Hey, that was mine too, by the way. Yeah, my I parents, wrote it. Uh, my parents I, bought me a computer. I remember it plugged into a TV and we we didn't have a color TV for us. So it plugged into a black <laughs> and white TV. And I think the computer was actually a color computer. This, this The TI-85 is a calculator. So I wrote programs oh, on a calculator. I'm thinking of the TI-99. Yes. I, yeah. I programmed that TI-85 calculator too. I do remember that yeah. being foundational. And so. then I went through, like, I went to college to be an electrical engineer and took a few classes in computer science because those were sort of required and really liked, I think there was a quick basic class that I really liked. Then I got to an electromagnetics fields and waves class and went, this isn't for me. And switched more towards the computer side and ended for a computer engineering degree. So that's kind of how I got into computer science. And then coming out of college, obviously I interviewed with, with Crow, um, partly because I liked what Crow offered, partly because Crow was located where my my girlfriend at the time lived. <laughs> so it was a good fit. And then you know, I met you and uh, started at Crow. And I think you were the first uh, project. It was first project I was on was with you there too. So. That's kind of how I, I got into computer science and, and the, the consulting gigs. That's interesting, yeah. What, do you remember what the first project is we worked on together? C2 Manager. Like the, uh, I, it was, this was way back before Agile had like really taken off. And I remember working on a, probably like a 120 page design document of all the different classes that it was going to be in, in this C2 Manager, which was like a, a, a way for banks to take online applications way before online applications was really a thing. Mm-hmm. We were trying to build a little product inside, a, inside of Crow. Yeah, we were basically trying to build like a little SaaS business. Yeah. And it and it actually got off the ground. Like we sold it to multiple banks and yeah. they implemented it and they used it for 15 years probably. Yeah. I, I I bet and then Becker, who will be a future interview here on the podcast, he he um uh he supported it and it continued to enhance it after we were gone. And, and there were banks using it for 15 years. So, and Crow, yeah. I think, was selling, you know, contracts to to run it. Yeah, so, we were going on several sales calls with you to, to do that. With sales at that time was like way out of my my interest and my comfort zone. But I remember going on on several of those as <laughs> as uh, like the, the techie to sell yeah. them on the technology we were using. Yeah. And then, 
and then we, so we did that. And then we did other consulting things with Crow. Um, but we were like also, um, I mean, we were, we were kind of working in a group that was very entrepreneurial inside of Crow. I mean, there's most, a lot of people there are consultants with an entrepreneurial mindset. We were working for one of them. His name was Kim Hemis. And, uh, and he was a visionary, right? Like yeah, he could sell definitely. anything and he could help people understand big picture stuff. And, and then he would just sell it and then everyone else had to figure it out. Right. That's right. Yep. That was, that was our job was to distill down what he sold and figure <laughs> out how to turn that into something so that we could implement it for somebody. It was a great experience. Uh, learned tons from him. And, uh, and then, uh, and then, and then I like got burnt out because I was, that world just wasn't kind of going where I wanted to go with my life and career. And then I went back into the consulting group and then I got this gig at Domino's. Uh, and it was like an opportunity to go work on their point of sale system. And I had done like some point of sale system work for McDonald's in Oak Brook. Uh, so I had like relevant experience and they wanted me to handle the payment process. So taking credit cards to the new POS and how did that work all the way back to the payment processor? And, uh, and that was an interesting domain, but I was traveling over to Ann Arbor from Grand Rapids all the time and living in a corporate apartment with three other guys. And I eventually just said, this is it. I can't do it. I got, and I left for Sagestone and I left you yeah. and then what happened? They, they put me on that project. <laughs> I think there was one other person who was there for a couple months and then they put me on that project. And I was doing the same thing you were doing for nine months and for, for whatever that worked out, that was while my wife was pregnant with our first kid and I quit as the same, same type of thing where it was too much travel, too much doing this stuff. I'm like I can convince my wife while I'm, why I'm traveling. I can't tell a kid, Hey, I'm going to yeah. be gone for, for weeks, but I quit that job two weeks before my first, first daughter was born. And that's when we went to, that's when I recruited you to come work at Sagestone, yeah. right? Yep. And so I came over to Sagestone. And Sagestone was at the time it was a .NET Gold. I think it was a .NET Gold partner, like back in the day, right when right early earliest days of .NET. I think when I started working with them, .NET was still in beta, and we were working. We were they were already building .NET apps, which I thought was pretty cutting edge. And at that time, I was very Microsoft centric in my, you know, skill set, and uh, and so that was an interesting opportunity. And it was a consulting business, but it was way different than working at Crow. What? What do you remember? It was way more technical. Like at Crow, I don't want to say I was like at the top of the technical heap there, but I was up near the top of technical skills. Crow was much more business consulting focused, whereas whereas Sagestone, I was anywhere near the top of the, the like technical prowess that was there. It was very, very much technical. It was it was good to like I learned a lot about like how to properly write code and not just solve business problems in the fastest way possible. I learned quite a bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. That, I do remember being a lot more technical. I really thrived in that for a long time. I enjoyed it, you know? Um and then it and then that th that's when we started our first business together, wasn't it? Yeah. We had a uh, a client came to us um, in the building, they came to us, what, like a month or two weeks before March Madness started and said, Hey, we want to run a March Madness contest. And you'd done something at Crow that was, was, uh, that did most of what they wanted <laughs> Yeah, in for an internal tool. And then we took that, made it, stood it up for them, made it a little public facing. What was the tool? Few, I don't even remember what it was called, but it was basically a way for you to to take brackets, like take entries for, yes. for March Madness. So you could fill out yes. your brackets online instead of doing it through like pieces of paper and a spreadsheet and, and right. all that. And it would score everything for you. And uh, I remember afterwards, you're like, we should turn this into a business. <laughs> and so we started spending nights and weekends and early mornings and just all kinds of time putting into this to just kind of build this thing out. Yeah, I think I I think I remember one time coming to your house and I was writing code and your your baby uh, was it was it Allie? It was Maddie? I think it was Maddie. Maddie was she was sitting on my lap. Yeah, yeah, like I was writing code with your baby on my lap. <laughs> yep, I think that might have been the last time we did it at my house. Too. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> um, and then uh, and then okay, so so what was your so like we started working on Turning Logic, which was 
actually the bracket control, right? Remember the web controls? And it was like yep. kind of an encapsulation of the bracket concept, which was super highly technical. We like way geeked out on that thing. Yeah. And, uh, and then we didn't really sell that, but it turned into Turnitopia, which was like the actual like SaaS focused business that could take uh, you could do white labeled bracketology. So March Madness pools, you could like set up your own pool and run it. And we learned a ton through that. I mean, we, I remember the first, really the first, our first customer was playboy.com. Yeah. Wasn't it? You called me at like eight or nine o'clock at night. Like, dude, you have to hear this voicemail. <laughs> <laughs> and they were doing what do, you the, what do you remember that, that voicemail? They wanted to do a playmate pick them where you could make picks against playmates and see how you'd performed against them. Oh my gosh. And we ended up implementing that. And we didn't yeah. have like a, we had a thing called the tourney pool manager, which was like, it was like, you could download a web-based application, and install it on your internet. I mean, come on. Like we were so, so engineers at that point. Yes. And, uh, that was but awesome. I remember like Google was running it internally on their servers for their internal bracketology contest. Remember that? Yeah, I do. Yep. And it was such a pain to maintain. That was probably, probably one of the biggest lessons early on was, Hey, if we stand this up on our own servers and, and host it versus making it downloadable, we can update it whenever we want to fix bugs all throughout the tournament without having to publish a new, new piece of software that people have to go download and install. Yeah. So much easier to maintain. Yes. And that turned into Turnitopia, which still is in existence today. And uh, it, it runs some pretty huge bracket contests for companies that use it for marketing contests. I mean, we've had the tennis channel has been a customer for over a decade and mm -hmm. they run all the major tennis contests through it. And we've had Microsoft, Time Warner Cable. We've had Aerosmith run a custom bracket, bracket on the system, um, all kinds of stuff. But it was interesting because we were doing that at the same time we were doing consulting work. We were developing code and, and systems for all kinds of different clients too, right? Yeah. So yep. we had like, we had this going on in days or nights and, and weekends and mornings and stuff and whenever it would fit in. And then we had like full-time jobs and families too, right? Right. Yeah. It was uh, like, I, I still look back and go, I don't know how we did that. Yeah. I don't either. Lack of it, was, sleep. it was good. I just wish that we would have like had a little bit more wisdom at that stage to like pull ourselves up a little higher. You know, we were still trying to figure out all the code and all the problems in the code. And it'd been nice if we could have like, thought about like a little bit more business minded. Um, yeah. Did zero marketing. I think we ran Google ads one time. We're like, well, we didn't really do anything. We didn't know what we were doing. It didn't work out for us. So let's never try that again. We just never really marketed the site. Yeah. And yeah, we never did. And, uh, and, and really that was like, that was a huge takeaway from that. And it still exists and it's actually produced a pretty decent return for us. Um, but I feel like, uh, you know, like we could have made it much, much bigger than what it has become. Um, if we knew now what we, what we knew then what we know now, but that learning took us into another business venture together. Right. Cause I, and I, I think it was, I, SageStone got bought by Newsoft, And at that time we were working on like uh, a big system for national city mortgage. Right. We were and they turned into PNC. They got, um, bought during the the financial crisis of 2008 and uh and but we had built like basically a huge mortgage system that was a virtual loan officer it even handled heloc loans as well as purchase and refi advanced scenarios with a whole online application integration to like a back-end crm system and i don't know yeah i, I remember I, I got a mortgage during that time and, and I, I felt sorry for the mortgage guy because I knew so much more about how the mortgage process worked than he did. <laughs> he was trying to tell me stuff like, no, I think that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, we had like a pricing engine that we developed off of the yeah. guidelines from yep. Freddie Mac, I think. And that we a lot of that was was based off like what we did there was based off learnings in Turnitopia. Like we we took that, that that I like to tell people that's one of the most successful projects we've ever done. And it probably took six months longer than we initially laid out and cost twice as much. And the client was thrilled right. because we, we were constantly getting feedback. I think that's one of the first consulting projects that I've done where like, we really put it in front of the client all the time and let yeah. them see it the whole step of the way. And they were fully defining like, Oh, okay. Based off this, let's work on X next instead of what we yeah. were going to do. And yep. we really, really sort of like pushed them to control 
the software's destiny. And as a result, they decided they want to do way more than they originally thought they did right. and take a little longer to do it right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, what's interesting is, you know, who the first customer for Augusto, I'm fast forwarding a little bit. Our first customer is Jeff Lee, who is yep. now the CEO of a mortgage company. And he was one of our product managers at National City Mortgage. That's right. Yep. And he's been so, a customer of Augusto, a client of Augusto for this whole time. Like basically every, every year yep. he's got work he wants to do with us. Yeah. And his business is exploding right now. It's so fun to watch him and be part of what he's doing. Um, okay, so so Turnitopia, we built Turnitopia, we sold it, we, we grew it, we learned a ton. And then like we both kind of hit the end of the road when Newsoft sold to RCM Technologies, a publicly traded company, and uh, just didn't like where the culture was going, didn't like their vision of where they were going. And so I decided to leave first, and then you decided to leave. Not we actually, I don't we our last day was the same day i think I, you 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 uh you had you had yours you gave two weeks and when i gave my two weeks they said how about one <laughs> and uh we ended up leaving on the same day wow and i don't think we were really even talking that much no. about t- leaving or anything because it was just such a high sensitivity time there's like lots of pressure yeah. on all of us and stuff like yeah. we were not talking about leaving. yeah i remember i remember calling you from from an airport and talking to you and I'm like, Hey, I got something I need to tell you. And you're like, Oh, I've got something I need to tell you. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Right. Yep. And we kind of knew it was all coming, but we weren't talking about it. And then, and then we both left. So you went to track about, and I went to OST and, and like we can go into that history later, but tell, what did you learn at track about? Cause track about wasn't a consulting gig. Right. I, I've been in consulting and working on multiple different things, which is kind of why I went into consulting, right? Because I wanted the chance to work on a ton of different things in a bunch of different areas. And I kind of got to the point where I'm like, I really just want to, I don't even know if my code is maintainable. Like the code that I write, I'm, I've never see it after six months. Mm-hmm. So let's see if I can write maintainable code. And I, and I went to track about, I worked with, uh, I actually found that job off of Twitter from someone I followed on Twitter and learned a ton of, of programming skills about, you know, about test driven development. And we, we would very much followed a lot of what we did with, with national city, where we would put new, new pieces of functionality long before it was even ready to be released in front of our clients to see what they were, what they thought of it, adjust it, like building a product versus, you know, something, you know, a piece of software that we just hand off was, was a big change for me. And I, so it, it was fun for, for 10 years or so to, to get into that world and learned a ton about how to do product development. And as part of that, I worked up and I managed the development team. So I learned a lot about how to manage a team and that company was, so basically in 2008 is is when I started working remotely. So I learned a lot about how to to manage remote teams and work with remote teams. And I did some remote at at Newsoft and and RCM at the end, but the team wasn't remote, I was, I just, didn't want to drive into the office. So mm-hmm. it, that's a completely different type of culture than a fully remote team. So I learned yeah. a lot about that in that time too. Yeah. And yeah, we see tons of benefits in having a, a remote first culture, um, which I think spawns out of all that stuff. Like I remember even the story about traveling to Ann Arbor, like we didn't have an option to work remote. None of these tools existed, the video technology, the screen sharing, the virtual whiteboards, all that stuff didn't exist. Slack didn't exist or teams or whatever <laughs> all collaboration that, tool. What's funny used. is a lot of that stuff did exist. It was just painful. I remember yes. when I started at Trackabout, like the CTO there was like, well, I had the option of going through the pain of building a remote team because he started in 2000 or I could move to Pittsburgh. And he's like, I didn't want to move to Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. So he took the, the the pain of doing that. And it was painful at first. Like I remember the early days of when I was at Trackball, like we probably went through seven or eight different video softwares of like trying to share screens and things like that, that would either be really good and then just fall off the market. Microsoft had a great one that they, that they just killed off for no reason, it seemed. Mm-hmm. Um, or ones that were just awful that you'd try. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is really bad and painful. They were there. They just weren't nearly as as easy as they are now. Yeah. Yep. I hear what you're saying, and and I do agree that they existed. I mean, there was chat technologies, there was screen sharing technology. They just weren't as integrated, and right. they weren't like packaged up and thought through the way they are these days. And I think they're just going to continue to get better. Um, and but what's interesting about 
that whole journey is when we split off and went these different ways, we, we still worked on, we launched another business together. Yeah. That was pay a square pay two now. Yeah. Yep. And cause we recognized like we were starting to think more like business people instead of engineers, but we were still engineers at heart, but we were seeing business problems now. Oh, Hey, look, it's hard for people to pay each other when they are collecting money for a sports team or they're going on a trip together or something like this. So we started with this group payments concept concept and used our payments knowledge from what we were doing at McDonald's and, and Domino's and stuff. And we, we, built up a, a place where you could create pages and collect money from people. Um, and just, you publish a simple page and then you list people that owe you money and they come and pay. And we integrated with PayPal and uh, Square and WePay. And there was like a whole journey there. And that took years. We, we, if I remember correctly, we paid some of our profits for me to go out to San Francisco because we were invited by PayPal to go to their Innovate conference. And I think we won our category that year. What do you recall any of that? I remember, so we used we used the profits from Turnitopia to <laughs> okay. pay for you to go out there. And and I think we won like a $10,000 prize for, yeah. and I don't even remember what it was for, but it was something from PayPal because you went to the, a PayPal conference. And, yes. And you were like, we're going like there's lots of traction out here. Lots of people are really interested in what we're doing. And, and you won this innovation prize of, of some sort. And you talked to, I think, I think that might've been where you first talked to some of the founders of, of WePay, right? Uh, I think Early I, on. I think I like, yeah, I think I went after, I like had known about them and maybe interacted with them through email. And then because I was there, they were down in Palo Alto. So I made arrangements to go down and see them in person. And I remember going to their office. I remember and they knew I was coming in. So they were kind of hyper aware of PayPal and they knew I was coming in. There was a big conference was there. So they actually got like this huge ice block made and they put this like plaque inside the ice block and it said PayPal freezes accounts. And they put it, I remember watching because walking to the conference, like all these people and this huge ice block and they set it up in front of the conference door. And they, then they just laughed and they were just cracking up and laughing and stuff. And, ever, and then like, there was like this whole big thing at the conference because they had like done this stunt to, to put this thing out that said PayPal freezes accounts. Yeah, that was they big. Were, PayPal used to freeze accounts. Like if you used it for anything, we ran into that when we were looking at doing stuff for uh, like collecting payments or something like that for, yes. for Turnitopia, they would freeze, freeze accounts. Yes. So I just remember that we worked on that for a long time and then we came back and I think like we were in those stages still of like extreme family, you know, like young families. And so I didn't really understand the fundraising process that well. And I ended up like doing a deal with OST and Dan Beam and Dan was, could see the vision of where we were going. And so he decided to invest and they bought the majority interest to pay at square. Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah. and then we worked on that hard for a while, and it and it ran its course. But it was it, at one point I think it was making almost twenty thousand dollars a month. Yeah. So that was yep. like a bigger success, and it was happening like every month, every day. People were paying. We were getting revenue, and uh, and then it just it was kind of like a pay it square was like kind of a square peg in a round hole at OST. It just never got what it needed, or or we didn't have the knowledge to do or the time to do what we needed to do on it. And, uh, and, and it ultimately like has declined, but it's still in business, still, still helping people collect money. And if you search for collect money on the web, it's still one of the top search results you'll get for thousands of collecting money scenarios. Right. Yeah. It's, it's still out there. It's still, it's interesting to see it sort of like the, the long tail of some of these things is interesting to see how long they last when you don't really, you're not really even putting anything into it anymore. Hey, Joel, I just want to cut in for a second and and bring part one to an end and we'll tee up part two which is coming after the break and that is to focus on what are the things that we've learned from the engineering perspective the product development perspective and how do we run products development projects and what are we excited about in the future so talk to you after the break hey thanks for listening to the augusto digital insights podcast Augusto is a custom software design and development company. If we can help you on your next project or you just want to say hello, contact me today by calling 616-427-1914 or visit www.augustodigital.com. 
Remember, you can always find this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Google, and YouTube.